Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are excited to be with you. For those of you that are not familiar with us, you might know us from some of our social media accounts, or some of you may know me from MBS Highway. But Matt and I, and Matt, you could say a quick hello here, but Matt and I are two of the co founders of Crypto Charged, which is a platform that we developed over the last few years to really help people interested in the crypto market or investors in the crypto market to really understand the space, to understand things from multiple different facets. We take a look at the macro because obviously that can have a big impact on all the markets out there. We have a lot of things happening with inflation, the Fed, there's talks about a recession. So we cover all of this. We look at things like on-chain analytics as well. Of course, we take a look at the individual projects out there. There's so many crypto projects. There's a lot of scams out there you have to be careful of. We break those down. And of course, we take a look at the charts. And Matt's about as good as it gets on the technical analysis as well as breaking down the industry news. So Matt, say a quick hello before we really get into the purpose of this call. Well, how's it going, team? I'm so glad you guys decided to join us here today. My name is Matthew Breenan. I've been uh, running Crypto Charge with Dan uh, for about two years now. I've been studying charts for about eight years, and uh, I really, really am very passionate about the crypto markets for the last five or six. So I'm really excited to share some of that knowledge with you guys today, talk a bit about the altcoin market and uh, kind of how we can help you guys through this crypto journey. Well, team, again, thank you for joining us. I know some of you on the East Coast, it's you know 8 p.m. on the West Coast, it's 5 p.m., but thought this was a good time to really talk about one of the most exciting investments out there, which is cryptocurrencies. And on today's call, you know, we really want to move it, make it fast paced and go over what the macro environment looks like and why we think that cryptocurrencies are going to provide the most exciting and attractive returns, albeit with a lot of volatility, over the next several years. So let's jump right into it and really go through what our thought process is. So one thing I want to just look at is how Bitcoin specifically has performed against all the other major asset classes out there. And you can see this is going back to 2011. So why has crypto been getting so much attention? Well, because it's been explosive. You can see that 2023, this data here is a little bit old, but Bitcoin itself is up about 120 to 130 percent from the start of this year. Now, yes, it's still down from its all-time high that we saw of 69,000, but it has been making a very nice move higher. If you look at cumulative returns from 2011 to when this was created here in 2023, you can see Bitcoin thousands and thousands of a percent return versus all the other asset classes. The nearest one is the NASDAQ over that same period of time with 617%. So obviously nothing is even close. And if you look at an annualized rate of return over that period of time, Bitcoin's averaging about 150%. The next closest is the NASDAQ at 17%. Now, as we're going to go over, we still think there's a lot of runway and opportunity ahead, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't come without some pitfalls, without some volatility and timing as well as choosing the correct projects is extremely important. So some of you on here, are probably familiar with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. For some of you, this may be brand new. So at a high level, I just wanna go over what Bitcoin is and really why it was created. So Bitcoin is really a new monetary system. Now, do I think that this is going to replace the dollar? No, I don't think that this is something that's going to take over for the dollar, at least in its current standing, because there's tax implications currently if you were to sell Bitcoin and you had a profit, but Bitcoin is indeed a new monetary system. But unlike our current monetary system in the United States, which is centralized, this is completely and truly decentralized. So there's no central bank or government determining that we need more dollars to stimulate the economy, determining the price of money as the Fed does. And there's also no middlemen like banks. I mean, think about it. Do you really own your money? Well, if it's in cash, the answer is yes. But we know that th certain things can impact the value of that cash and its purchasing power, but most of us have money at banks. Well, banks are middlemen that are necessary in a centralized finance system. But we've seen some horror stories out there, right? Banks locking accounts, banks misappropriating funds, or you know, large institutions being you know, recipients of some hacks out there. But the truth of the matter is, is you rely on these institutions to facilitate the flow of funds, whether it's credit card companies, whether it's banks. So you need these middlemen in a centralized finance system. 
when we talk about things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, there is no banks. You truly bank yourself and you have complete control of your money. Now, the other thing is, is we know dollars can be created out of thin air. Heck, that's part of the reason why the dollar continues to be devalued over time. We have massive amounts of debts that we'll get into. The U.S. continues to deficit spend. And our purchasing power in a banner year only goes down by 2%, according to the goal of the Fed. With Bitcoin, it is actually a deflationary asset. There's only 21 million of Bitcoin that can ever be created. Nobody can just say, you know what? We need to stimulate the crypto market. Let's create more Bitcoin. You know, to some degree, and in some ways, it could be analogous to gold. Why is gold a good hedge? Well, because it's a scarce natural resource, right? You can mine more of it, but it's expensive. There's a limited amount, although we don't know exactly how much, but nobody can just go ahead and create natural gold out of thin air, which is why it's a good hedge and it's a good store of value. Bitcoin is also the same in that way, in that nature. But we know there is a hard stop. Only 21 million can ever be created, of which over 19 and a half million have already been created. The other thing is, is with this new monetary system in this digital age, which this cryptocurrencies that we're talking about, they've really been created, not adapted to the digital age. And you can send your money with Bitcoin anywhere you want in the world, whenever you want, typically in minutes at a much cheaper cost than you'd be able to if you wanted to try to wire money across borders. If you ever tried that, it can be very expensive and take a very long period of time. The other thing with things on the blockchain and Bitcoin specifically is these transactions are final. There's no changing of the record. So obviously you need to be careful, but there's no scenarios where you can have bailouts or things of that nature like we see in our centralized finance system. Let's just take a look at some of the problems in the United States and why this is likely not sustainable forever. This is something called the US debt clock. You can pull this up and it's a little bit scary because while this is a screenshot of it, if you go to the website, you could see in real time how the national debt is just climbing at a ridiculous rate. Currently, it's just under $34 trillion. Now, why does this keep getting worse? Because you can see on here, we take in tax receipts, right? That's how we get our money as a country, the United States, as a government. But then we also spend. And we are deficit spending at a ridiculous rate. You know, they, they just removed the debt ceiling. And our deficit is almost $2 trillion. So this national debt continues to get worse. Now, how do we get out of it? Well, there's really no site to get out of it because you would have to almost have a reset in the United States. And I don't think any president is going to win on a ticket of, you know what, elect me, it's gonna be really hard. The economy is gonna have a really difficult time, but we're gonna spend responsibly. We're gonna cut a bunch of spending and we're gonna make sure that we chip away at this deficit. So what do we continue to do as a country? We continue to go more and more and more into debt. But by doing so, that has a significant and material impact on our dollars and on our purchasing power. And it causes inflation. Now, you may have heard that inflation has been coming down, but I want to make an important distinction for you. Coming down in the rate of change is very different than inflation actually going down. Take a look at this long-term chart going back to 1940. This blue line is inflation. And you could see it pretty much always goes up, sometimes at a slower pace, but over time it always goes up with a few exceptions. You could see a few scenarios, really during recessionary periods, inflation actually goes down, but this chart is up and to the right. So what does that mean? That means that in almost all cases, your dollar gets eroded, the purchasing power of it, by inflation. Inflation, the definition, is too many dollars chasing too few goods, and it causes, causes the price of things to go up. Well, when the price of goods and services go up, that same dollar that you had last year, it can purchase less. But there's also a cumulative impact. You may have heard that the Fed has been hiking rates, They've been trying to get rid of this big inflation problem that we have that the Fed and the government largely created. Remember, we had COVID. We had the government wanting to stimulate the economy. They did $5.2 trillion in stimulus. 
We also had a Federal Reserve that was very accommodative, and they injected a ton of liquidity, did a ton of buying of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, and we got 40-plus year high inflation. The CPI was up 9% year over year at one point. Now, it's come down. The latest reading on the CPI is 3%, but that doesn't mean that that previous gain in inflation went away. It just means that after that gain in inflation, after the cost of goods and services has gone up, it's now increasing at a slower pace. And the Fed, what is their target? Their target is 2% inflation. But as I'm about to show you, that still means your value is getting devalued. Your dollar is getting devalued. Take a look at just over the last five years. Cumulatively, we've seen inflation go up 25%. So what does that mean? Let's use an example. If you have $100 five years ago, the purchasing power of it comparatively is really like $75 today. And let's just kind of really explain the point. What if you had $100,000 five years ago? It's really like you can only purchase $75,000 worth of things. And this is due to inflation and the purchasing power of your dollars getting devalued. Now, this is really because we have a centralized finance system. You have these powers at B that are controlling the supply of money, controlling the cost of money. It's out of our control. But, you know, some people would consider it, you know, akin to theft, right? Or something of that nature. And even if the Fed reaches their 2% target, if they reach their goal next year and inflation comes down to only 2%, you know, you can use something called the rule of 72 and you can see that you still lose half of your money, half of your purchasing power over a 35 year period of time. But I don't even think the Fed's going to be able to necessarily get to that exact 2% target. And we know inflation was much higher prior to that. So we talked about a little bit about the Federal Reserve. You know, they have a lot of power and they have specifically two mandates. They want to have maximum employment and they want to have stable prices. So what they do is they manipulate something called the Fed funds rate. And this is really determining the cost of money out there. I mean, they are adjusting and tinkering with the most important commodity in the world, the dollar. So many things are denominated in the dollar. We're the reserve currency. But the Federal Reserve makes mistakes. If you take a look at this chart, this blue line shows you the federal funds rate and these gray vertical bars are your recessions. Why do we get boom and bust cycles in the United States? It's because the Fed overcorrects. You know, earlier this morning, I got in the shower. And tell me if some of you guys have done the same thing. You get in the shower and the water, you know, I was in a rush, right? I went to the Rangers game last night. It was a late night. So, you know, didn't exactly get up exactly the time I wanted to. I run in the shower and the water's cold. So what do I do? I adjust the dial all the way hot. Now, eventually it starts to warm up. But then what happens? I start scolding my skin because I turn the dial too much because I overcorrect it. So then what do I have to do? I have to dial it back to more of a Goldilocks level. I want you to think about that analogy because that's pretty much what the Federal Reserve does with their monetary policy. Now, listen, it's not an easy task because there's lags involved, but the Fed almost always is too accommodative for too long, meaning they keep rates at zero, they provide too much liquidity out there, and they cause a boom cycle. But then inflation gets too hot because they leave it there for too long. The Fed is not good at projecting where things are going to go. Imagine driving in a car, but looking in the rear view mirror instead of out the front windshield. That's pretty much what the Fed does with monetary policy. So they keep it too accommodated for too long. Inflation gets crazy. And then they have to start hiking rates to slow down the economy. Because when the Fed hikes, cost of money gets more expensive right? Whether it's personal loans, business loans, short-term treasuries, money market accounts, all these things go up when the Fed hikes. So what it does is it slows down the demand side of the economy because money is more expensive. People don't expand as much or borrow as much. Car loan rates go up, credit card rates go up. And take a look at what happens. Fed goes on a rate hike cycle. They slow the economy too much. You get a recession and then the Fed starts cutting. Same thing happens in almost every scenario on this chart. But take a look here on the far right. This is the current time. The Fed has gone on one of the most aggressive rate hike cycles in history. 
and they have hiked 525 basis points. And I'm sure many of you listening have felt this, right? I mean, you see what's happened with mortgage rates, right? They started to come down a little bit, but they were at 8% just last month. You see car loan rates now, 10, 11%, credit card rates, 25%, you know, home equity lines of credit, you name it, money is more expensive. And this is all due to the Fed. Now, what's going to happen? Do I think this time is going to be any different? No. I think there's a good chance we could see a recession sometime next year, potentially Q1 or Q2. Well, that's not exactly going to be a fun scenario, but the Fed's going to have to start cutting rates. And what does the Fed cuts do to our dollar? Well, this chart shows you the Fed funds rate in blue and the dollar here in this kind of pinkish orange color. Well, you could see how well correlated these are, but as the Fed hikes, the strength of the dollar increases. As the Fed cuts, they're more stimulative, they're more accommodative, the value of the dollar goes down. But this is something that can help things like Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency markets. Because remember, while you know they are their own cryptocurrencies, there's an exchange rate. Because when you or I are buying or selling these things, we're using dollars. Well, if the value of the dollar goes down, that means the value of the cryptocurrency based on an exchange rate goes up. But there's other things at play here too. So you guys have all heard about in March, the banking crisis. We had the second, third, and fourth largest banks go out of business. SVB, First Republic, Signature, right? All of these companies, thanks to the Fed hiking so fast, they had a fleeing of deposits. And this is another issue with our banking system, right? Where they only have to keep about 10% of deposits on hand, and then they lend out the rest at a higher rate and make that spread. They pay you very little in your deposit account, a fraction of a percent, lend it at a higher rate, make the spread. Or they invest in safe assets. Well, guess what? The Fed hiked so much, you gave people a better opportunity to make money. Why would I get half a percent when I can invest in a money market account thanks to the Fed hiking and get over 5% return? See, you had banks going out of business. We've talked about before, and I'm sure you guys heard about how a lot of people got burned, right? FDIC insurance, a lot of these banks didn't have. Even so, there's a limit on how much you're insured by. So innately, banks and our centralized finance system have some issues. Now, I'm not saying cryptocurrency is going to replace that or solve for all these problems, but I'm explaining to you why cryptocurrency was pretty much created, why Bitcoin was created and removing the power from these central authorities and having a system that operates on a protocol, doesn't have emotion operates on its own where nobody can manipulate this stuff and with a finite amount, why it can be an unbelievable store of value and why we're seeing the smartest minds uh, innovate in the space, why the largest companies now trying to create assets, investable assets around the space. And guess what else we have? We talked a little bit about this, but we have the debt ceiling that's been removed. So we keep compounding the issues that we have. Deficits up two trillion since June. Our credit rating in the U.S. got downgraded. That certainly didn't help things. And you have the Federal Reserve. So when is the Fed going to start cutting rates? Because you know the Fed, in my opinion, is going to be forced to when the economy continues to slow. We've seen inflation, the rate of change, come down a lot. Went from nine percent down to three percent. Now the core rate of inflation, we just got that this week on the CPI was three and a half. That's been making progress, right? It's been cut almost in half, but the Fed wants to see it at 2%. But if we project out, you know, the Fed's not going to wait for it to get to 2% before they start cutting rates because they have to try to do it in advance of that and project what's happening in the economy. Well, the economy is starting to slow. Now, GDP in Q3 was very strong, but it's unsustainable. The more recent reports that we've been getting in real time, they've been showing the consumer is strapped. They are spending all kinds of money on credit, depleting their savings. That kind of stuff can only go on for so long before you can't spend anymore. And retail sales was negative. You know, in the PCE report, spending declined. And when we take a look at you know, the student loan payments that are now coming, right? Consumers are having a difficult time. And you add to that all the inflation out there, I think we're going to hit a wall. So I think the Fed's hand is going to be forced much sooner than they're saying as far as cutting rates goes. And here's my projection on it. You know, I think the Federal Reserve will cut rates when we see inflation come a little bit lower. So if we look at the core PCE, which is their favorite measure, 
It was just three and a half percent as of this week. And using just two tenths of a percent increases over the next several reports, you could see that by about March of 2024 and April, you're going to be getting the core PCE, that favorite measure of inflation that they like, around 2.6 to 2.5%. I think that will be enough for the Fed to start cutting rates, especially when you consider what the state of the economy is going to be at that time. The most recent jobs data is finally starting to show some cracks. We've seen the unemployment rate go up half a percent from the cycle low in April. That going back to 1960 with 100% accuracy has signaled the recession either immediately or two months following that. So I think Q1 is actually a pretty good estimate for when we could really start to see things slow. However, you have to remember, we won't know we're in a recession till the summer or the fall because recessions are called in arrears. So I think when we take a look, it would be around March or April when we get the data that would support them cutting as well as other things happening in the economy. But we have to take a look at when the Fed would announce this by looking at what their meeting schedule is. The Fed has a Federal Reserve Open meeting, uh, open Committee meeting every six weeks. So we have one coming up in December. I've been saying for a while, I think the Fed's done cutting rates and they've now paused twice in a row, uh, done hiking rates, I should say. So the December meeting, they're going to sit on their hands. They're not going to do anything on December 13th. Then they have one on January 31st, one on March 20th. And then they have one on May 1st and June 12th. So this data, I think, will get to a point where they will be comfortable cutting somewhere around March or April. So that means that I think they're going to start cutting rates either at the May 1st meeting or the June 12th meeting. And I think they're going to start by cutting 25 basis points. Well, what does the market think? You know, just like some people out there, I mean, including myself, we like to bet on things like DraftKings. You can bet using something called the Fed futures on when the Fed is going to start cutting rates. And if you look at the market's predictions, they think there's a 43% chance the Fed starts cutting at the March 20th meeting, but there's a 76% chance they start cutting May 1st and a 93% chance they start cutting on June 12th. Now, it doesn't mean they have to be right. The Fed futures can oftentimes be wrong, but this is exactly in line with my thought process. But there's another issue here. The Fed has amassed an enormously large balance sheet. At one point, it was about $9 trillion. Remember a few years ago, the Fed not only cut rates to zero, they were trying to stimulate the economy and keep rates low. So they bought trillions and trillions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities and treasuries, which artificially kept things like mortgage rates down under 3%, even though inflation began to rise. Well, now the Fed as of April of last year, said, you know what? We need to start reducing this balance sheet. So the things that would normally mature off their balance sheet or when they receive principal payments from those holdings that they have, they let those roll off. And you could see the balance sheet has been reducing at about a trillion dollar year pace. But the Fed has announced that, you know, they're eventually going to stop this reduction, which is called quantitative tightening. Now, when do I think they're going to stop this? Well, I think it would be foolish and kind of counterintuitive for the Fed to have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, meaning when they start cutting rates, it's likely to believe that shortly thereafter, they're probably going to stop quantitative tightening. So what does that mean? Well, that means all those assets rolling off their balance sheet or principal payments they're receiving, they're likely going to start reinvesting them into mortgage-backed securities and treasuries and be a buyer once again. What does that mean? Well, that means they're going to be accommodative. They're going to stimulate the economy, but also that could lead to more inflation. And they're going to do this because the economy is going to force them to because it's going to slow down. Now, as a silver lining, cryptocurrencies as a hedge, especially things like Bitcoin, always perform well during those times. The dollar moves lower. And on a comparative basis, cryptocurrencies do well. When do I think this could occur? I think we could see this by the June 12th meeting. Now, there's another thing happening with Bitcoin that you may have heard about. And I want to really lay out a case for you for why I think it is a really smart financial decision to have at least some investment in assets like Bitcoin, as well as some other cryptocurrencies that Matt's going to go over. Now, and no means saying invest all your money in Bitcoin, but as a fiduciary, right? I mean, I used to be a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. You want to have a certain allocation to different asset classes, right? Whether it's stocks, bonds, alternative, emerging funds, gold, precious metals, 
But cryptocurrency, I think, has the best asymmetrical return probability out there than any other asset. I tell people, if you don't like it, if you don't believe in it, invest a few percentage points. If you like it, you know, maybe invest 5 to 10% of your portfolio, whatever you're comfortable with. You know, A lot of times people see the cost of Bitcoin, 37000 and change, and they're like, well, I can only buy you know, $500 worth or $1,000 worth. The percent returns are still the same. Invest what you can so you have some exposure as a good hedge and also have a really good opportunity. But listen, it's volatile. You have to be prepared to see some big swings in that. But there's something happening next year called the Bitcoin Havoc. Now, this sounds like, you know, what, what's a havoc, right? Well, it's about 138 days away. It's estimated it's going to be April 17th of 2024. And the way Bitcoin works is it operates on a protocol. So remember what we talked about with our financial system here. You could have $5.2 trillion in stimulus. You could have the Fed determining the cost of the dollar and money and stimulate things or restrict things like they've been doing. It doesn't work like that with Bitcoin. With Bitcoin... You have all of these participants that plug in to this decentralized, transparent global network. They use their computing power and energy, and they keep the network secure to kind of explain this in a easy to understand way. And there's all these transactions that are occurring. It's a peer to peer network that need to be verified in these blocks and then written to the blockchain. Well, the only way that you get new Bitcoin created is not the government saying, hey, we need some stimmies. It's a byproduct of keeping the network secure. So Bitcoin was created in about 2009. And when it was created, the reward for keeping the network secure and writing a block to the blockchain yielded 50 Bitcoin. But then what happens is the mathematical equation on the Bitcoin network keeps it so that about every 10 minutes you have a new block written to the blockchain. So you do the math. Over the course of a day, there's 144 blocks on average. Well, that means that you have new Bitcoin being created, coming into circulation is 7,200 a day. But then every four years, you get a Bitcoin halving event. That means that the reward of Bitcoin, the byproduct of keeping the network secure, gets cut in half. So 2012, the reward went from 50 to 25. Now, what does that mean? It means miners are going to be making less per block that they mine. But the big impact here is that the supply of Bitcoin coming to market gets cut in half. So imagine any asset out there. Why has housing done so well over the last several years? You have demand and then supply, which has been at record low levels. More demand, less supply, price goes up, right? Of course, there could be other factors. Well, with Bitcoin every four years, the supply coming to market every day gets cut in half. So as of 2012, supply coming into circulation, 3,600 a day. As of 2016, 1,800 a day. As of 2020, we're in that current four-year halving cycle, it's 900 a day. Well, guess what happens in April of next year? The supply coming to market gets cut even further from 900 to 450 a day. This is an asset, unlike the dollar, this is an asset that continues to get more scarce with every four years that comes. In fact, with every day that comes because we are getting closer and closer and closer to the finality of 21 million Bitcoin that can ever be created. As I mentioned earlier, 19 and a half million have already been created. So this is an asset that is deflationary, not inflationary. But what's the you know cycle that you hear about? You know, Bitcoin has, at least so far in history, a very clear four-year cycle. You have a bullish period of time, right? It hits an all-time high. Then you have a bearish period of time where you can see some significant losses and retracements from that all-time high. And then you have somewhat of a sideways period of time. Well, notice the pattern here. Typically a little bit before and then much more after the halving event, do you see a huge run up over the next one to two years or so where you set a new all-time high? Well, where are we now in this cycle? Well, we clearly had the run up to 69,000. Then those of you invested in the crypto market know that we had a very ugly bear market. And now we've gotten into this kind of sideways to a little bit higher period of time, now a few months away from the halving. So what do you think is going to happen? Well, as the supply of an asset gets cut in half, I think, of course, it's going to move higher and follow this same pattern. And other people are watching this too. There's a lot more interest and investment that comes around the halving event. 
But let's take a look at some of the performance. So after the first halving, right, at the halving, the price of Bitcoin was $12. Well, the peak date, which happened about a year later, was $1,157 per coin. So you saw about a 100x return after the first halving. After the second halving, you saw a 30x return. And after the most recent halving that happened in 2020, you saw an 800% or an 8x return. Now, clearly you're seeing as the asset matures, the returns, while still extremely attractive, better than any asset out there, are getting a little bit less juicy. But this upcoming halving has some things that are happening that we have never seen in the history of Bitcoin. And specifically, it has to do with institutional investment, which we'll get there in just a second. But one thing that's unique to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is that it operates on a blockchain. So you can actually derive some really interesting on-chain analytics and see investor behavior. And Bitcoin is such an illiquid asset. Again, remember our example with housing. You, know, you have less supply coming to the market, but you also have nobody selling. If you take a look at Bitcoin and you look at how many coins have not been sold or moved in over three months, it's 88% of the supply. How about over six months? It's 76% of the supply. Over one year, 70%. Over two years, think about the volatility we've seen over the last year or two years. Over 60% of the supply. And even over 10 years, you have 15% of the supply. So you have an asset that is approaching the terminal 21 million. The amount coming to market every day is getting cut in half every four years. And just April of next year, it will happen again. And you have this price agnostic group of investors that believe in this asset and are holding on for dear life for higher prices and have not been shaken even with 80% drawdowns, even with Bitcoin going up over 120% from the start of this year. So think about how much supply is locked up. You know, with anything, if you have no supply and then strong demand comes in, it's going to bid the price higher and in a hurry. And also, people have taken self custody of cryptocurrencies, which is something that is unique to crypto. You can do so with gold as well and take physical gold, but you certainly can't hold your stock, right? You have to keep it at an exchange or something of that nature or with your you know, portfolio manager. But with cryptocurrency, you don't need a third party counter risk. And you have to be careful because some people get burned with different exchanges that are bad actors out there, but you can actually take self custody of your Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, put it on a ledger, and by memorizing a seed phrase, you can access your money anywhere in the world at any time. But you and only you can have access to your crypto. You don't need a bank. You don't need a third party. You can eliminate that counterparty risk. But we talked about supply, illiquid, supply coming to market getting cut in half, coming out to the terminal 21 million, which we're not that far away from. What about demand? Well, you get demand that comes naturally as the price goes up and retail investors FOMO in. Right? Nobody wanted to buy it when it was at 15000 and change, but I bet you a lot of people are going to want to buy it when it's at 60000 But you also have other things happening here. And this is why it's different than any other halving cycle. You have something called a spot ETF that all the largest firms in the world have been filing for. BlackRock's, Fidelity's, JP Morgan Chase, you name it. Just take a look at this list. Why are they doing this? because they're getting so much demand from their investor base. Now, you can go on a Coinbase and you can create an account and you can fund it with money from your bank and buy cryptocurrencies. But think about it. People with millions, billions of dollars in your traditional brokerage accounts, especially those who are a little bit older, are they going to go ahead and do that? Most likely not. So you have all this money locked up, trillions of dollars, that they're not going to go buy Bitcoin. Well, what's a spot ETF? Well, that basically means it's an exchange traded fund. And all these companies have been, as of this week, even there's updates meeting with the SEC to try to get this approved. Once one gets approved, that means that right from your stock portfolio, you will be able to buy Bitcoin with this ETF. And it's not on the futures market. The actual ETF will be purchasing Bitcoin. So this gives you not only on the individual side, so much more exposure for all of these funds to come in. I mean, just these companies have 27 trillion assets under management. But remember, 
It's not just these companies. Once a spot ETF is available, anybody can buy in the stock market. If you got 1%, you would almost you know, increase the Bitcoin market cap by 50%. Think about what that would do to price, but you'd likely get much more than that. And really the foremost leader on the status of this is a man by the name of Eric Balchinus. And he works for Bloomberg. He really heads up what's happening with ETFs. He's circling January 10th. He thinks by that date, we will see a spot ETF get approved. Now we've seen Bitcoin on rumors of this getting approved and updates on this really increase significantly over this year in price. Now you could see temporarily a sell the a buy the rumor and sell the news type of scenario. But listen, if you're thinking more than just a few months here, this is going to bring a ton of investment from investors that would not normally be buying Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies into the crypto market. But what a lot of people aren't thinking about is the bigger picture here, is the institutional investors that can get in. And this is really where this market right now differs from others. You, you have not had institutions besides maybe a few, like a micro strategy out there with Michael Saylor that have been allowed to even purchase Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies because it's against their bylaws, because there's not enough regulatory clarity. Once you have a spot ETF that's approved, these companies can then do so. You also unlock a lot of derivative markets because then you can you know, use leverage within the United States, not just on overseas accounts with VPNs because there's a spot ETF available. But think about this. Once you have Bitcoin and other cryptos recognized as an ins institutional asset, you can have things like pensions, endowments, insurance, investment portfolios. You can have individual companies all buying cryptocurrencies and a lot of these are passive side investments. So over time, you know, this can really amount to a huge investment in the space. Let's just look at an example of a company that did buy some Bitcoin. In 2020, it was a big deal that Mass Mutual invested $100 million into Bitcoin. But they managed $235 billion in assets. So the allocation is 0.05%. So when you put it in those terms, it's a very small allocation of what they potentially could invest it. But when we look from the all-time high of Bitcoin at 69,000, if you were to passively invest in it, and I want to show you this example because a lot of times people talk about Bitcoin and cryptos being too volatile. Well, if you passively invested like a lot of these different companies would, you would have gained 45% in Bitcoin versus losing 12% in the bond market. We've seen one of the worst bond markets team you know, in history. And guess what? This company has invested 53% of their allocation in bonds. So you can't really say that cryptocurrencies would be more risky than that, that this wouldn't have provided them a much better return. But once you have the regulatory clarity, once you have the spot ETFs, you no longer have these institutions that have only been able to historically watch from the sidelines. Imagine what happens if all these institutions, these different companies allocate even single digit allocation into cryptocurrencies, what could happen? For the first time, they will have access. And this is part of the reason why you see companies like ARK, Kathy Wood, you may have heard of her, one of the most thought leaders on the, especially tech space out there, why her goal, or I should say her target in a bear case is over the next six or seven years for Bitcoin to hit 200 and roughly 60,000 per coin. Her base case is Bitcoin's going to be 683,000 per coin. And in a bull case, things can get up past a million dollars per coin. Now, that might sound far-fetched and crazy. And listen, do I think that this is maybe a little bit overzealous? Sure. But I think you can clearly see, based on some of the things we went over, why you can see the demand and that weaning supply and the illiquidity of Bitcoin really propel, propel the price higher. Now, in her forecast here, in ARK's forecast, Take a look at what they're looking at. Some of the things we talked about. Well, what happens if you get some corporate treasuries that now buy Bitcoin? What happens if you have some institutional investments that buy in it, right? So what if you have some nation state treasuries? Listen, we've already seen some countries out there start to adopt Bitcoin. It's not out of the realm that you can see a few hundred thousand over time per coin. But I think we could see just over the next 18 months to two years, Bitcoin go above 100,000. Now, right now, as we're talking, it's somewhere around 37,000 per coin. But I think you could see Bitcoin get up over 100,000 
sometime a year or so after the halving, potentially, maybe a little bit longer. So this is something that I really want you to consider. Obviously, do something that you know, you're comfortable with and make sense as a part of your a part of your portfolio. But there's certainly a reason why the smartest minds in the world are investing in it, innovating in the space, and why the largest companies out there are filing for these spot ETFs, which I believe will be approved by the first quarter of next year. But that's not to say there's not some risks. Now, Bitcoin is a volatile asset. Now, the bond market's been pretty much more volatile over the last year. However, look at these drawdowns during each of these cycles. If you remember, I showed you that chart where there's you know, every four years a cycle. You have your bull part, then you have your big bear market. Well, this is showing you what happens during the bear markets. 92% drawdown from the all-time high at that point. 83% drawdown from the all-time high. 83% again. And most recently, from the 69,000, we saw about a 77% drawdown. The reason why I'm showing you this is timing is critical. And Matt and I are going to show you some ways that with our platform we've created, Crypto Charged, we can really help guide you with this and help you to make the best investment decisions. And there's also scams you have to be concerned with. You know, it's estimated that you know, because of the the euphoria in the space and because it's a complicated space and a lot of people don't know necessarily what they're doing, there's a lot of scams. It's estimated that about 25% of the new coins that are being created are scams. So you need to make sure, even like a stock, right, that you're investing in quality. You need to make sure you understand the projects that you're investing in. And there's a lot more than just Bitcoin out there. Now, I'm a big believer in Bitcoin. I think it's one of the safest assets. But as Matt's going to go over, there's a lot of other projects we like. And he's going to show you some of the ways within crypto charges in our platform that we help educate you on those different coins. Go ahead. Well, that's right, Dan. You've done a great job kind of laying the case on why we're so passionate about investing in crypto. And, you know, of course, it's an asset class that's very new, something that I think is going to provide a lot of long term value to the space. But one of the biggest driving forces for me personally is to not only just keep up with inflation, but to aggressively outpace inflation. And we know that, like Dan has just illustrated, that that's not a consistent linear growth when we look at inflation, right? It's really turned into more of exponential growth. So we really have to do our best to invest in things that are going to give us great ROI, but we also have to be very careful. Like Dan mentioned, about one in four new tokens today are just a straight up scam, regardless of the price that it shows you on the screen there. So in the sea of garbage out there, we do our very best to do a lot of research, identify a handful of good quality assets that we can invest in, give you guys those technical setups, give you guys the fundamentals, give you guys those daily updates. Um, but I wanted to talk to you guys about just three assets that I'm very passionate about in the altcoin space. We have plenty more on our website that we you know, offer you guys some insights on, but these are some of the assets that I think that you guys might want to consider outside of Bitcoin, of course, everyone's risk tolerance is going to be a little bit different. You know, some people want to be a little more Bitcoin oriented. Some people want to be a little more altcoin oriented. But even within our altcoin picks, we need to be very careful. We need to make sure that we're only investing in high quality assets that also offer great technical upside. So one of my first assets here and an asset I've been accumulating for a long time, but a fan of a long time is going to be XRP. XRP was built in 2012 for global payments. So one of the biggest issues we have out there is remittance payments and cross-border payments, right? Um, one of the main issues that we run into is if you do a lot of business in other countries, especially smaller countries, you're going to have to have pre-funded accounts in those countries in order to make those payments, meaning you have all this money that you could be using for other things that could be liquid for other things that has to sit in this bank account and has to be topped up regularly in order to have fast and efficient payments through those countries. So with XRP, we're eliminating that need for a pre-funded account, and we're able to send money to any corner in the world for under three seconds for a fraction of a penny. Now, of course, a gas fee will you know, be proportional to the amount of money you're spending uh, sending. But in most cases, you're spending just, you know, a penny or less a lot of the time to send a very large amount of money very quickly to another part of the world. Uh, this is utilized in Ripple's tech stack. So Ripple is a financial tech company that is utilizing XRP and has been utilizing XRP for about a decade now. Um, and they're offering that, again, deep on-demand liquidity for money transmitters. They've created so many partnerships with banks around the world 
with money transmitters around the world. It is becoming a very widely adopted asset. They also recently, uh, Ripple was recently in a lawsuit with the SEC and XRP within itself was declared a non-security. So it's actually the only digital asset right now with regulatory clarity as a non-security asset, making it one again, one of my best fundamental picks, uh, kind of on the safer side, actually, out of some of my altcoin picks. Uh, we also have native cost-effective NFTs. I'm sure you guys have heard of NFTs. It's the ability to tokenize tangible and intangible items. So it could be anything from art, digital art, to a car title, to your home, anything can be turned into an NFT. And now with XLS20, the most recent amendment, we have those natively available on XRP, uh, the XRP ledger, and can essentially do NFTs very, very cheaply. We also have side chains for building custom permissioned and permissionless apps. So although a lot of these, you know, networks, whether we're talking about Bitcoin or XRP or Ethereum, they have, you know, their specific parameters that say, hey, this is how the protocol works. With XRP, you can create something called a side chain where you still get to all to syndicate all the main benefits and features from the XRP ledger, but you can set up certain contingencies within your own protocol. So let's say you have a business and you want to accept XRP, you can reject transactions under a certain amount of XRP, you can only accept from certain addresses. You can create custom environments on the XRP ledger to suit your specific needs. Uh, the next one that I'm very bullish on, and this is kind of stepping down into some of the smaller crap side, but again, within my altcoin portfolio, I want to have some exposure to some of the larger caps, and I also want to have exposure to the smaller caps where I get the opportunity to potentially get a higher ROI. Of course, a little bit more risk with a smaller cap, right? Um, so again, you need to assess your risk appetite and say, you know, how much volatility am I comfortable with? Um, Casper is built for, uh, with enterprise in mind with a focus on tokenizing intellectual property via NFTs and smart contracts. 90% of the S&P 500 is intellectual property right now. Imagine if we were able to tokenize that in a very efficient way uh, and be able to sell fractions of patents, be able to sell and transfer patents very, very quickly and easily. Um, we also have the ability for on-chain smart contract upgrades. I know that's a mouthful, but a lot of these smart contract platforms don't give you the ability to customize these smart contracts your specific needs. Some of them are kind of raw and rudimentary. So with the ability for us to upgrade those and customize them to a specific enterprise need, you're creating a lot more flexibility and a plug and play solution for a lot of enterprises that don't want to build everything from scratch. We also have predictable gas fees. A lot of times with things like the Ethereum network, we unfortunately have unpredictable and very high gas fees where sometimes in the bull run, you would have a NFT on the Ethereum network, you'd be looking to sell it. And unfortunately, the fee would exceed the actual value of your NFT and it wouldn't be worth selling it. So you would actually wait it out until gas fees you know, come down and hopefully the price of your NFT is still up, right? With Casper, we're able to get those a lot more predictable and a lot more consistent and a lot cheaper, right? Uh, and of course, we also have the proof of stake model. So you know, we have some assets like Bitcoin and Zcash that are still utilizing the proof of work model where a machine essentially does work to solve a, a you know an algorithm essentially and you receive a reward for you know completing a portion of a block or a whole block. With the proof of stake model, essentially, we delegate our coins to validators uh, who run these nodes and we share some of the reward or the APY with those validators for staking those to help secure the network. So proof of stake is quickly becoming one of the most effective models. Ethereum was previously proof of work and has moved to proof of stake. Again, I just want to illustrate one more vertical for you guys here uh, and that's going to be API 3. So, you know, when we look at something like an Oracle, an Oracle is basically just a, uh, a data feed, right? So when you guys see the weather on your phone or you're checking the sports scores, those are pulled via API. APIs and via oracles. And what happens a lot of times with these feeds, you know, if, if you get the weather a little bit wrong, it's not that bad of a big of a deal, right? If that's if that data feeds corrupted. But if I'm doing something like a smart contract, right? And I have the smart contract that says I'm going to buy this house for a million dollars and I'm going to put these stable coins in and the smart contract's going to execute automatically based on, you know, uh, certain conditions being met. But let's say that we're using something like Ethereum or XRP where the price is fluctuating. And within that smart contract, we need to call in an oracle or an API, uh, API in order to get that data. And we need to make sure that that data is perfect. It can't be corrupted in any capacity, right? Because if we say the price of Ethereum is $2,000, but you know the corrupted API feed tells us the price of Ethereum is $50, right? Someone's going to get a really good deal and someone's going to get a really bad deal, right? And sometimes reversing those transactions can be very rough just depending on you know what set of circumstances you're dealing with. So decentralized first party APIs is very, very important. Now it's not the sexiest subject, but I again want to illustrate that there's a lot of solutions within crypto that aren't just, hey, everything is trying to be money, everybody's just trying to make peer to peer transactions cheaper and easier. There's other solutions and mechanisms in crypto that are very important. So of course, by removing the need for middlemen, API 3 reduces both cost and the complexity typically associated with the traditional oracles and data feeds. And of course, this is fully decentralized and uh, organized and the consensus is through a decentralized autonomous organization. So 
we're not, again, not relying on a third party to provide those feeds. Um, I wanted to show you guys a couple charts because when we look at um, some of our pricing, right, we look at, hey, how do we kind of figure out where we think prices are going to go? Historically, how has this worked, right? Um, you guys can see I have a huge watch list on the right side here. This is just some of the stuff we do at Crypto Charge for you guys, um, keeping an eye on this stuff all the time, updating the charts for you. Um, but one of our favorite tools is the Fibonacci retracement tool. And the Fibonacci sequence, you guys have probably heard of it when you guys were in school. It's just a sequence where you add the previous two numbers in the sequence to get the next number in the sequence. When we select a range, we of course get those uh, ratios divided out and the inverse of that is extension, so multiplication. And it does all of this for us. It's really not overly complicated. So when we look at our long-term holds, a lot of times we can pick a cycle high and a cycle low, and we can get a pretty good indication of where price might land within a pocket, right? We can, of course, create, create a plan from there, create some exit plans and try to layer out. So when we look at historically, like even if we look at the fractal from 2013 here on Bitcoin and we go swing high to swing low, we pick the high from 2013 and the low over here for 2014, 2015. You guys can see that this extension and these sequences go forever, right? They could technically go forever. It goes well beyond 377, but for all intents and purposes, I go up to 377. It's more than enough for most of the data I'm looking at. But a lot of these can create topping structures for us and suggest this is where the next market top is, right? In this example, we see that using this range, the 55 extension was a pretty decent top in there. And we can also go through other ranges and say, is this still relevant? And does this still provide us a decent and reasonable outcome, right? If we were to look from the more recent swing high and swing low, so the 2017, 2018 cycle that everyone remembers very well, right? We can see that we actually topped out towards a more familiar Fibonacci range. So here at Crypto Charge, we like to look at the 1.618 all the way through the 4.236 as potential areas of interest to exit an asset. Now, of course, we we'll use some of these retracements in here to identify areas of interest for purchasing, but we're kind of getting towards the other side of that now, right? Where we need to start using limit-based ordering in order to be more effective, right? Um, so this is where we get some of our pricing from, right? We can see even from the last cycle that the eight extension suggests over a $100,000 Bitcoin price. And then finally, if we were to go from the most recent swing high and swing low, so the 2021 high down to the 2022 low, we can see that that first First, 1.618 puts it right around $100,000 to the top target being almost $230,000. Now, of course, part of our strategy is layering out and dollar cost averaging out of our positions, just like we've been diligently over the last 18 to 24 months, dollar cost averaging into our positions. I'm going to show you one more chart here. We're going to look at XRP because we talk quite a bit about XRP at the top of uh, my segment here on the webinar with you guys. Looking at the 2013 high here, and then we also have the lows that were set, multiple lows, one, two, three, triple bottom in here. We can see that XRP actually reached well beyond a 4.236, stuttered here a bit, which would not have been a terrible place to take profit, but all the way reaches out to a 55 extension. Interestingly enough, when we looked at the Bitcoin fractal, the earliest fractal we could pull price history from, it also double topped at a 55 extension from this most recent cycle. Now, during this last piece of depressive price action here, we unfortunately had the SEC lawsuit going on. That is now 99% over, and for us investors, it is fully over because XRP has regulatory clarity as a non-security within itself. So when we look at kind of where we could potentially get the next cycle top, right, we can go ahead and for the more recent cycle here, because we didn't make a new high in 2022, we can see that the 1.618 to the 4.236 puts us between $5 and $13. XRP is trading around 60 cents right now. So there's plenty of opportunities still in these markets. There's lots of altcoins that are further back in their cycles, just like XRP right now. And you're going to potentially provide you guys really great opportunity to enter the market layer out, get yourself a nice bag for this next cycle and be more prepared if this is your first time around. Now, I want to show you guys a little bit of the tools that we offer here at CryptoCharge.com to help you guys be a little bit more in tune with you know the general process. So first and foremost, we do a live show five days a week. So this is going to be Monday through Friday. We do a live show for you guys. I also do a morning update with you guys. This is a three to five minute update in the morning. Where we just take a quick look at the charts to show you guys. Here's what we're expecting top down, the stock market, metals, oil, top cryptos that we're focused on at the time. I I want you guys to understand this is a full educational experience. We don't explicitly focus on crypto, even though it is one of the bigger focal points within our program here. We also have our long-term trade ideas here. Anything that is uh, within our dollar cost averaging parameters, it will automatically pop up here on your homepage. We curate just the absolute best news for you guys. We don't flood you guys with 50 articles and say, read these. We pick two a day for you guys to read. Uh, we have our learning center that's constantly being added to a daily edge here. So this is basically a written article from the day's show. So if you don't have time to watch a show, you have the opportunity to view that. We also have our coin library. This is probably one of the favorite features that we have here from our members, where you have the ability to sort by risk category. Um, if it's a safe entry or not, you can search by project return on investment. You can search by which exchanges on. You can also mix, mix and match these categories. And within there, we give you guys our buy points. We give our, you guys 
guys the dollar cost averaging points. We give you our three point uh, exit plan for each and every asset. And then we also have charts in there that are updated once a week. So every single Wednesday, we have these charts fully refreshed for you guys with updated notes if you guys need that information. And then we also have our beginner center, uh, section here as well as our entire learning center. So if you guys are new, you guys need to get the course down. We have five to six minute video bites in here for you guys to get educated on that. And of course, our Discord community. I want to say this is probably one of the biggest values outside of our coin library that people really enjoy because we don't expect you guys to just watch our content and go, cool, got it. I'm ready to invest in crypto. I'm fully confident now. We know you guys are going to have questions and you're going to have ongoing questions and you guys want to feel confident you have somebody to reach out to. Me and my moderators are in there seven days a week and we generally get back to you guys in an hour to two hours tops on any questions you guys have. So you guys have the ability to ask questions in here. We do updates in here. We have trade ideas in here. All of that information is at your fingertips and easy to scroll. Uh, now, Dan, I think you also had a special pricing for us. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So listen, team, since this is the first webinar of, of this kind that we've been doing, you know, we really hope that it was informative, give you a little background on crypto and you know, Bitcoin and some of the other assets out there that we're excited about. And also piqued your interest on what the opportunity is, but also some of the things that you need to watch out for. And we've really spent a lot of time in developing this crypto charge platform, as Matt mentioned, to educate you every morning and every evening or afternoon, depending on where you're located, with not just what's happening in crypto, of course, we cover that, but a bigger look, you'll get the best macro breakdown out there of any company, but you'll also be getting crypto specific insights, you'll get a look at the charts, you also get a look at on chain analytics. So we look at things from a multi-pronged approach to try to give you the best assets and the best education so you can make the smartest decisions. Now, you know, a platform like this, normally we think we charge a pretty affordable rate of $99 a month or $9.99 a year. But because this is the first call we're doing like this, we wanted to give you an opportunity to jump on at a 50% discount. So you can pay $50 a month or $500 a year to get access to crypto charge. But it's even better than that because what we do first, you'd sign up, you choose which plan you want, you use the code BULL, as in bull market, to get the discount. But before we even charge you, we give you a 30-day trial membership that then automatically renews so you can get a feel for the service. You can join the discard, see, see what kind of a great community we have, and take a look at some of the insights that we provide. So listen, this is limited time team. We'd love for you to join the Crypto Charge family. You just go to our website, CryptoCharge.com, you sign up, you can choose your monthly or annual plan, and you use the code BULL, and that will give you a 30-day free membership, which then automatically renews thereafter at whatever you choose, either the monthly or the annual plan.